I'm Bonnie Marmer, co-president of the Point San Pedro Road Coalition, and we're going to give folks a couple of minutes to sign on and join us. Uh, and uh, we're doing this uh, meeting this morning as a Zoom meeting rather than as a Zoom webinar, which is different for us. Um, our past community meetings that we've done online have been webinars where we didn't see the faces of the folks who are in attendance and we thought it would be nice to see who's with us so um, as you sign on and join us uh, we'd love to see your your faces if you feel like turning on your cameras and you're comfortable doing that no worries if you are not comfortable with that no, no pressure but uh, we thought it would be more like our our old former in-person community meetings where we got to know one another and recognize our neighbors. So this will be a little bit less formal this morning than we've had uh, in our, our pandemic time Zoom webinars uh, where we haven't been able to get together in person. So hopefully this will uh, work well. We've got Ellen Shavitz, uh, our uh, webmaster running the show here today. And again, um, we're gonna have some uh, information for you shortly on how this is how this is gonna go. In fact, uh, Alan, why don't you go ahead and uh, get some information on the screen about how we're gonna run the meeting this morning while I uh, uh, continue to chat and welcome everyone. So um, the event is being recorded. So if you turn on your camera, um, I imagine your picture will be there on the recording. This is a different kind of recording for us. Um, we do have closed captioning available. Feel free to uh, turn that on and get your live transcript. Um, we'll be using the chat to enter questions for the Q&A this morning. And uh, you, know, you can raise your hand if you wanna be able to speak and ask your question directly. Um, of course, uh, I should interrupt that that's the raised hand icon at the bottom, which puts a raised hand up there that allows me to call on you to ask your question rather than just uh, jumping in. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Ellen. Um, yeah. And of course, we always appreciate uh, donations to the coalition at our website. You can donate by just clicking the donate button and do that online. Um, our neighbors have been very generous um, and we've been most appreciative uh, that the donations have enabled us to be a, uh, a force in our community to uh, make changes uh, and do a lot of really wonderful projects. And for those of you that are new to the coalition, maybe you've never attended a coalition meeting before, um, you can get lots of information from our website. Um, you can find out about what's going on in our community, you get announcements, um, as well as history of the of the coalition. Um, also, if you haven't voted yet, um, you know you can take a look at the recording of our candidates form. The link for that is on our uh, website. So lots of information, updates on Loch Lomond Marina. If you're curious about what's going on there, um, information uh, about our past meetings, you can actually watch recordings of our other events on our YouTube channel, which you can reach on our resources tab on the website. Uh, so, uh, as to our meeting today, our agenda is going to focus on a specific topic. We have a theme today, which is safety, personal safety in our homes, fire safety for our homes and community, and planning and preparing for future floods and sea level rise. So, uh, that's the theme for today. We've got some great speakers, lots of information. Um, before we get started on our agenda, um, we are going to um, uh, have some updates from some of our committees, but I just wanted to let you know how the agenda is going to go uh, for today. Um, we will hear from Under Sheriff Jamie Scardina on the issue of preparing for home and personal security. Um, he's going to give us some tips on being aware and practical safety tips. Um, after he speaks, our uh, disaster prep chair, John Lenzer, is going to make a, a few uh, comments about disaster prep, and he will introduce Quinn Gardner and Kate Anderson from San Rafael's Office of Emergency Services on being a fire-adapted community. 
Um, and then we are going to uh, have an introduction for our speaker on flooding and sea level rise. Uh, Winifred Dejani is going to handle that intro for Kathleen Schaefer. So we're delighted to have all of our speakers here today. And we thank them all for being here. And we thank all the attendees that have signed in. We've got quite a crowd already, and I'm sure more people are signing again signing in. Again, if you're just signing in, my name is Bonnie Marmer. I am co-president of the Point San Pedro Road Coalition, and I want to introduce some other members of our board. First of all, Denise Lucy, my co-president. Denise, wave and say hi. <laughs> well, hi. Hi, everyone. Denise is going to give us a little um, mini update uh, about the San Rafael Rock Quarry, and she's going to serve as our timekeeper today. Um, also today we have uh, Alan Shavitz, who I've, who's, you may have met if you signed on early here. Uh, he is our webmaster and he is going to be our ringmaster and <laughs> running the meeting this morning for us, handling the Q&A, et, et cetera. So uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, Kevin Haggerty here, is here this morning. Hi, Kevin. Uh, he's going to be giving a very brief uh, uh, little update on our uh Roadway. He's our Roadway Committee Chair. Uh, and then Winifred Dijani is the Hi. Chair. Uh, our, she is our Wetlands Committee Chair, and she will tell you the latest about the Wetlands Committee. Uh, and I mentioned John Lenzer, our Disaster Prep uh, Chair, is here, and you will hear from him later on in the meeting. So uh, let me at this time ask uh, Denise to make a, a few comments about the quarry. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Really appreciate all the time you give to our community. We're all volunteers here, so really appreciate it. We wanted to make sure you were aware that we are in cooperation with the Sit and Rafael Rock Quarry. We've made some agreements together. They, they have a 20 year extension beyond 2024. And there were three key areas that we all felt needed additional dialogue. One is about the wetlands to ensure that the wetlands plan is suitable. They've agreed to a peer review. So an additional firm that's an expert will be brought in to look at the quarry, look at the wetlands quarry and work with, with us and with you. Also, we were concerned that air monitoring needs to be to continue. Air monitoring levels had been uh, we had monitored them in a while because they came to a point where they didn't need it, but we felt with 20 more years, we felt we needed air monitoring and the quarry is in cooperation to come up with a plan for that. And lastly, road repaving. We're not really quite sure what road repaving will be needed, but we are in dialogue about what, what may we do or what should we do and when should we do it. So that's, a, that's an ongoing dialogue. Let me just explain how the timekeeping is going to work. One minute before our speakers are to finish their communication before they ask your, your question, answer your questions, I'm going to do this. Okay, and then they will have five minutes to respond to your questions. And then a minute before that, those questions are ready to be finished. I will do this. So now we all know. Okay. And I will defer to you, Bonnie, for the next agenda. Okay. okay. So, Kevin, you want to say a few words about the uh, roadway? Sure. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, I had two updates. One is on the road diet. Um, the county is, is currently doing a parking study to help them inform them of options to deal with the uh, park, the Bayside Park parking issue. The, um, the roadway committee is continuing to monitor that situation. And it's our understanding that the county will hold a, a community meeting uh, after the study is completed to talk about options. The second option, uh, the second uh, item I want to, to uh, inform you on is on the median assessment uh, district fees for fiscal year 2022-23. Um, the coalition has been working with the city on the annual median assessment fee for the, this coming year. And with our support, we're recommending a dollar eight uh, $1.08 uh, increase for the coming year. The city uh, is, is in the process of scheduling a public hearing on the fee increase that will be held on July 5th. Um, and additional information regarding the fee increase will be 
published on, on the coalition's website sometime next week. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Winifred. Yes, hi everybody. I'm Winifred Dijani and uh, the Wetlands Committee is very dedicated to conserving and restoring and educating about the wetlands. Denise already explained to you these ongoing conversation we're having with the quarry regarding their plan, their restoration plan. So uh, we're very optimistic about that. And we're very excited. We regularly host webinars to help people uh, better understand the significance of the wetlands. And we're very excited to be hosting a webinar on Tuesday, June 14th with the San Francisco Bay program leader of Point Blue, Julian Wood, who will discuss why the wetlands are so significant to us in so many ways. And we're so lucky to have so many wetlands amongst us. And he will also walk us through one of their recent restoration projects. So regarding the wetlands, um, that's something you can go online and register for, and it promises to be very interesting. Um, also, the coalition has been recently engaged with other community groups uh, all around San, um, San Rafael to uh, establish an initiative to be proactive in mitigating the foreseeable negative impacts of sea level rise. And throughout that process, we've been so fortunate to have Kathleen Schaefer, who is one of our speakers today, inform us. And she is a nationally recognized expert in flood risk management. And she will be speaking. You will meet Kathleen later on during this community meeting. And that's all I have to say for now until we meet up with Kathleen. Great, thank you, Winifred. And I just wanna remind people that they can watch the Wetlands 101 uh, webinar that we had by just going to our website. So if they're interested in learning the basics before watching the Point Blue presentation, um, I, I think that would be great. And uh, I'm so excited that you put together this uh, Point Blue presentation for next week. And thank you so much for all that you're doing on behalf of our community. And uh, Thanks to Kevin and Denise for all their work and everybody else on our board and committee chairs that work so hard. Uh, as I mentioned, John Lenzer, our disaster prep community uh, committee chair will be speaking to you um, later on in, in the meeting. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to move on to introducing our first speaker, um, Under Sheriff Jamie Scardina. Um, and uh, I, uh, I'm going to just keep it brief, but just to let you know a little background on him. His name may be familiar, I hope it is, uh, because he is on your ballot. Uh, he's, he's actually running for sheriff, unopposed. Uh, so we expect he will soon be uh, the sheriff of Burn County. Uh, he is um, going to be stepping in, I believe, or most likely upon the retirement of Sheriff Doyle. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, as of January, uh, he will be our, our, our new sheriff. So we want to welcome him and tell you a little bit about him. He was um, Born and raised in Marin. He's a Marin native, grew up in McCord, Madeira, attended Marin Catholic. He then received an AA from the College of Marin. And then he got his BA from um, the University of Montana in Missoula. He uh, got a degree in sociology with an emphasis in criminology. So he joined the Marin County Sheriff's Office in the year 2000 and has worked his way up through the ranks from deputy sergeant uh, uh, to lieutenant to captain. And in December 8 of 2018, he was promoted to under sheriff. Uh, that makes him the second in command in the office. Um, and as, uh, as uh, he will be our next sheriff, I thought it would be great for our community to have a chance to meet him. And he's gonna focus on a topic of interest to, um, uh, to all of us. And so I'm gonna sign off now and let him take over from here. Thank you so much for joining us and filling us in on this important topic. Great, good morning, everybody. And thank you, Bonnie. Uh, I was actually going to give you a little uh, uh, info on myself, but Bonnie took care of that. So I will just uh, jump right into what I'm here to talk to you about. And that's a little bit about home and personal security. 
And what I've decided to do was uh, I had our crime analysis uh, pull up some stats for some of the neighborhoods that you all live in. Uh, the Peacock Gap, Glenwood, Loch Lomond, Country Club, Villa Real, Bayside area. Um, now, what I think is important to understand when you look at this is these particular areas are not all Marin County Sheriff's Office jurisdiction. And uh, quite frankly, um, the only area that is the Marin County Sheriff's Office is that uh, left side of the screen you see there, the Country Club. Um, those, all, most of those other areas, those are all San Rafael PD jurisdiction. Uh, but what we were able to do was pull up some crime stats uh, for both the agencies. So I can show you um, the last 17 months. This is January 2021 to uh, just a couple weeks ago, uh, last week in May. So um, as you look below the numbers, uh, we drew some auto burglary, residential burglary, motor vehicle theft, um, grand petty theft, and some vandalism. Uh, you may wonder what is the difference between an auto burglary and a uh, grand theft, petty theft. Um, that's usually when somebody leaves their car unlocked um, and a window isn't smashed or something like that. Um, that is what we refer to as grand or petty theft. Uh, if your window was smashed and broken into, that would be an auto burglary. You may wonder what is the difference between a grand theft and a petty theft, and that is the dollar amount. Uh, so anything over 900 would be a grand theft, anything under would be a petty theft. So um, I think it's important to look at some of these numbers um, and, and let's look at the grand theft and petty theft. Uh, these are what, about 41 cases, if, if I did my math right. Um, those are 41 cases where individuals probably left their vehicles open and uh, somebody came along and, and took whatever property was in there. So um, those are 41 potential cases that could have been avoidable uh, if, if uh, those victims had just hopefully locked their vehicles. Um, what we tend to see in auto burglaries is individuals who leave things in plain sight, whether it's on a seat, whether it's on the dashboard um, and, uh, or in the back seat. Uh, a backpack, a computer, whatever it might be, um, that's where we see, you know, a window smash and those things are easily uh, grabbed and taken. If you can, please put things in your trunk, uh, put, put a blanket over it, put something over uh, your valuables so it's not an attractable um, item for, for individuals to take. So um, other than that, uh, the numbers are actually, you know, when you look at 17 months worth of data, it's, it's, it's not too bad. Um, you know, what one a month, you know, it, it's relatively speaking, comparative around the county. Um, there are other areas that have much, much higher numbers than this, um, but you all do live in, in a safe uh, neighborhood from, from Country Club all the way to Peacock Gap. So um, what do we accredit that to? Um, hopefully, um, maybe it's a little bit of um, law enforcement being visible out there. Um, probably a lot more um, of you, the community, the neighbors, uh, keeping an eye on each other, keeping an eye on each other's property and each other's homes. And uh, so that should be uh, something that you should all focus on as well. So what can you, uh, the residents, do to keep yourself safe um, in, your, in your homes? First and foremost, um, if you can get cameras um, put on your home, that is probably by far the number one biggest deterrent um, to burglars. And where to put those cameras? Put them right where somebody can see them. Um, we have had interviews with many, many people we've arrested for, for residential burglaries. And they tell us time and time again, if they are walking down the street or driving down the street and they see a home with cameras, they'll just go on to the next home <laughs> and they'll look for a home that, that doesn't have cameras. Um, so don't try to hide your cameras. Um, I, I have cameras on my home and you could see them walking down the sidewalk. So um, don't be afraid to put them right where somebody uh, is gonna be able to see them. And it's important to also put those cameras at eye level. So, you know, six feet. Um, a lot of people sometimes will hang cameras from the rafters of their homes. While it's good and it's nice, uh, sometimes we can't get a very good picture uh, from those. So just something to think about. If you do have cameras, um, you can register your cameras uh, through the Marin County Sheriff's Office. 
And it's not something that we have access to, but it's a database that we keep so we can reach out to you uh, and ask for your uh, camera footage if there is some sort of crime in your neighborhood. Uh, rather than us having to go knock on each door, we can pull up this database and then uh, more quickly uh, reach out to you. Um, as I mentioned a little bit ago, please, please, please lock your doors. Um, whether it's your vehicles, whether it's your residence, um, people know that uh, Marin County, unfortunately, is a, is a crime of opportunity because people do feel so safe here. They just don't feel the need to lock their doors or lock their cars. Um, and as you could see by some of these statistics, uh, that uh, the higher statistics we have are those unlocked doors. So, so please lock your doors. Another one, motion lights. Very, very simple. Have motion lights uh, on your property uh, to deter people from coming uh, on your property. Um, trust your gut. If you see something, uh, say something. Uh, call us. That's why we're here. Uh, call. You don't have to call 911 necessarily. Um, call our non-emergency number, which is 415-479-2311. And, uh, and just say, hey, you know what? I, I'm, I'm not sure. This kind of looks... Um, a little fishy, but I would really like to have a unit come by and just do a drive-by. That's why we're here. Um, so give us a call and we'll come and we'll check it out. Um, so trust yourself, trust your instincts. If something doesn't seem right, it, it may not be right. Um, another thing you could do, a lot of people don't know, I, and this is only for the Marin County Sheriff's Office. Now, I, I can't speak for the San Rafael Police Department. We do vacation checks. So whether you're going on vacation for two days or 30 days, if you call uh, the Sheriff's Office and uh, tell us a little bit of, you know, your obviously your address and where you're going to be. We will actually come by. We will walk the perimeter of your residence while you're gone. And just to make sure that, um, you know, doors are locked, uh, windows are locked, and, uh, you know, that nobody has, has broken in while you're gone. So it, it's a service uh, that we provide to the community. Uh, you can sign up by calling that phone number I just gave you or actually go uh, by going to our website and filling out the form at uh, marinsheriff.org. Um, you could also file police reports um, on our on, online as well. So if you don't want a deputy uh, coming to your uh, house for any particular reason, you could go right online, fill out the uh, crime report, and somebody will call you back and, uh, and ask some additional questions. Um, I don't want to steal Quinn and uh, Kate's thunder, but um, please, 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 please sign up for Alert Marin. Um, that's how you get notified, and I'm sure they will talk about this too. Um, but please, you could, uh, and actually I went to the Point San Pedro Road Coalition website, and you guys have Alert Marin on there, so that is fantastic. Thank you, but um, that is how you will get uh, notifications uh, from us and from the Santa Fe Police Department uh, as well. Um, and, and then one last thing I want to touch upon before uh, opening it up to questions because uh, it seems to think when we when we do Zooms like this, a lot of people have questions and, and, and want to have more of a Q&A session rather than just hearing me speak. Um, we get a lot of phone calls from our community uh, that, hey, I just received a phone call from Sergeant Smith from the Marin County Sheriff's Office and, and, and they say I have a warrant and they want me to give them money so, so the warrant can be cleared up. The Marin County Sheriff's Office will never call you on the telephone and tell you you have a warrant and you have to pay over the phone uh, with a credit card to clear that warrant up. So if something doesn't seem right, um, it's not. So call us. Um, these are scams that are happening weekly all the time. We, we do the best we can to put out these notices on our social media, uh, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, or, or Instagram. Um, but, uh, but please pay attention to these. And um, you know, if, if somebody calls and, and, and says, hey, um, you know, you're, you know, little, little Johnny's in jail and uh, he, he got arrested for whatever it might be and, and his bail is $1,000 and um, if you give me your credit card number right now, uh, we'll, we'll let him out. Um, that's not going to happen. We, we would never, ever make that sort of a phone call. So um, once again, um, if it doesn't seem right, it's probably not right. So with that, um, I'll just see if anybody has any questions or if you want me to talk about um, anything other specific with the Marine County Sheriff's Office, uh, please feel free to ask away. There we go. Let me point out to uh, everyone again that um, you can ask questions by either um, 
typing your question using the chat icon uh, that you see at the bottom of your screen or use the raised hand if you want to actually verbally ask your question. And I'll call on you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, one question that was uh, posted on the chat was, is there an informative profile of the burglars? You mean a specific to a person or what, what do you mean by informative profile? Meaning, uh, it was my question. So is it, are they youth that are doing this? I mean, are they people who don't live in the neighborhood? Do you have any idea who's doing the burglaries? Yes, on all of that. Yes, it's, yes, it's youth, um, but primarily um, they're, they're adults. That's, that's what we're seeing. Um, and yes, we are seeing it's majority of people um, from the outside coming to Marin. That's not to say that Marin locals are not committing these types of crimes. They are, but I would say the majority uh, of individuals come to Marin because they know it's a crime of opportunity. Um, and, and quite frankly, there's, um, there's wealthy um, vehicles, residences uh, in our community, and they know that there are things that they could come in and, and steal and take and uh, cross one of the bridges and have it sold in, in 20 minutes. So, uh, so yes, we, we do see that uh, individuals from outside the area are coming. How about um, additional lighting around the homes? Uh, I assume I, in addition to the motion sensor lighting that you mentioned earlier, uh, any additional lighting, lighting inside the house or whatever, is that helpful as a deterrent? Absolutely, motion lights, uh, uh, timing lights. Uh, if, if you happen to go away on vacation, yes, the, uh, put, put your, uh, your lamps on a timer. I mean, those are all certainly um, good deterrent uh, things that you could use, absolutely. Um, I don't see any other questions unless they were asked. Kevin, no, looks like Kevin's Kevin. got one. Yeah. Kevin, go ahead. Uh, yeah, good morning. Th thank you for coming to, to uh, this morning and sharing your insights. I had a jurisdictional question. Um, a lot of the residents along Point San Pedro Road, some are in this, within the city boundaries, some are within the county. So some of these services that you've just talked about, are they applicable? For example, I live in the city. So would I be able to take advantage of your vacation walk around or if I need to file a police report, but I need to file it with the city as opposed to the sheriff's office? Yeah, so that's why at the beginning I said this, this applies just to the sheriff's office. Now, Centerfell PD may offer these. I, I just don't know whether they do or not. Um, so some, you'd, have, you'd have to have that answered um, by Centerfell PD. Uh, but no, we, we would not go into another jurisdiction um, and handle a crime report for them unless they asked us because they were busy for one reason or another and they couldn't, they couldn't handle a particular call. Um, and additionally, we would, we would not go do vacation checks in somebody else's jurisdiction. That would be up to, whether it's Novato PD or, or San Rafael PD, that would be up to them. Thank you. <laughs> go ahead, Bonnie. I, have, Bonnie. Well, I just wanted to comment. And you mentioned um, Country Club, but it's also Bayside Acres. Uh, just to be clear that we have uh, another whole area within our jurisdiction, uh, of the county jurisdiction. So it goes, County, city, county, city, mm -hmm. and then um, and then we go back to the county again. At uh, the quarry itself is within the the county jurisdiction, and then we go to the state park, I guess, uh, at the other end of the yeah. um, of the peninsula. Just so that we have this patchwork of uh, jurisdictions along here, which has proved to be a complexity with regard to lots of issues for our community. So it's helpful uh, to point that out for our community. Absolutely. Another, another point about jurisdiction is um, when it comes to roadways and speeders and stop signs and, and things like that. Um, obviously, San Rafael PD would handle uh, the city area. But when it comes to unincorporated Marin, uh, this California Highway Patrol handles um, that when it comes to traffic collisions, speeders. That's not to say that we, the Sheriff's Office, won't. It's just not our primary focus. Uh, that, is, that is handled by the California Highway Patrol. And we will work in conjunction uh, with them if they're speeders or stop sign violators in a particular area. Um, but uh, we, we have a very good relationship with CHP and, and we'll work with them. Uh, looks like Denise has a question. I have a follow up. Yeah. So the city of San Rafael, do they have similar practices as the county sheriff's office that you've just described? I would, I would think so. Yes, they do. Great. Thank you. 
not seeing any other questions, I think uh, we can move on to the agenda at this point. Thank you very much, uh, Under Sheriff Scardino. It's been very informative. All right, thank you all. And thank you very uh, much. Thanks for having me. And you can certainly reach me by email if you uh, have any further follow up questions. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. We're right back on time. So here we go. All right. John Lenzer is going to uh, say a few words and then. Um... Good. Um, good morning. I'm John Lenzer and I'm chair of the Disaster Prevention Committee of the coalition. The committee really got going about three years ago, and we had a lot of momentum. We were meeting in person, and along came COVID, and suddenly we all ended up on a screen like we are today, and that really sort of set us back for a couple of years in terms of getting the a lot of things done that we had hoped to get done, but we did make a lot of progress despite, despite COVID. Um, we have four general areas that we're working on. One is to encourage HOAs along the corridor uh, to organize their individual communities, either becoming a firewise community or um, neighborhood watch, uh, neighbor to neighbor. We have uh, a number of communities, Peacock, Glenwood, that are quite active. Ready Glenwood is just an example of excellence. Peacock is uh, likewise. Other communities are organizing. And that's one of our, our areas that we continue to encourage. Uh, the second is sort of more of a global, and that's having to deal with um, the purchase of supplies uh, and particularly medical supplies. You know, we need to address not only fire, but we need to think down the road if an earthquake occurred and we were really cut off. We have one way out of here and that's out past the high school. And if we were, if the whole area was impacted by an earthquake, we really have to be sufficient uh, for ourselves for a number of days, if not weeks. Uh, and so we have a lot of triage supplies um, centrally located where doctors could um, come and we could actually begin to treat uh, with first aid and what have you. Um, and then third is community resources. We're meeting with markets, with filling stations, drug stores. Uh, again, if the internet went down uh, and power went down, would Andes be operating? Could they take credit cards? Could they not? Would we be purely cash? We're working on all those issues to keep uh, those local services functioning uh, following a disaster. And finally, uh, training. And training uh, has been probably the most successful thing that we have done to date uh, besides purchasing the supplies. And we have a number of training programs coming up. This coming uh, Saturday, we have FADER training. Uh, that's first aid for disaster response. And it's put on by the Marin Medical Corps. and uh, we're gonna have 21 students up at St. Luke's uh, Presbyterian Church uh, sitting on the floor learning CPA, uh, stop the bleeding and other kinds of first aid. And that class became quickly oversubscribed. We already have a waiting list of almost 15 people uh, and we're gonna be scheduling another class in the not too distant future. So if you do wish to subscribe to that, send me an email. Uh, again, my name is John Lenzer. It's on the screen, and my email address is simple. It's just john at lenzer.com. So write that down and send me an email if you're interested in, the, in what we refer to as fader training. Uh, the next training opportunity is going to be um, on June 25th, and that's one hour to get ready, and that's going to be put on by the San Rafael Fire Department, and it's a an hour and a half class. Uh, again, it will be up at St. Luke's. Uh, and you again can go to the website of the coalition and you can uh, get the information for that class. There is no sign up. You just need to show up because we can take 120 people uh, in the Bayview room. So um, do, do plan on attending that. And finally, um, Quinn doesn't know this, but we did get approval for uh, use of the uh, church for July 16th, uh, the date that we have set up for a general community workshop uh, put on by the San Rafael Fire Department and the County of Marin uh, Fire uh, Prevention so that we can have a two hour workshop where we can really focus in on all of the community issues, evacuation, um, how to prepare. Uh, it's not really a training class so much as it is a workshop where we can have an interaction between the community and the fire department. So those are all being planned right now and we'll continue to hold those over the summer. 
Uh, we'll continue to work on all those other issues. If you wish to join our committee, we'd love to have you. We meet uh, quarterly. We're divided up into work groups that are addressing the various issues that I described. And we'd love to have you just, uh, again, email me at john at lenser.com. With that, I'm going to stop and turn it over to uh, uh, Quinn. John, John, can I interrupt just one quick question that was sure. really focused directly to you? You had mentioned medical supplies, and the question was, where are medical supplies located and who has access to them? So maybe you can give a status of the supply situation at this point. Yes, right now they're centrally located in at San Pedro Cove. The Cove has a uh, large uh, garage that's secure and we have sorted all those supplies into bins and they're ready to be used uh, should, should we have to. At the same time, we'd prefer to have those supplies mobile. And so we're in the process of purchasing a trailer similar to the one that several other communities have where we will keep at least half of the supplies in a trailer along with generators and tents and cots and other materials so that we could set up a triage center and we could roll the trailer out to wherever we need to go. Uh, we're hoping to uh, secure the right to use uh, Peacock Gap golf course facilities and other facilities up and down the corridor uh, should there be a fire or should uh, some other sort of disaster befall us. But for right now, uh, the supplies are secured here at San Pedro Cove and uh, the committee and others would respond to the Cove should there be a disaster. Um, I'd like to interject uh, really quickly, uh, just a brief comment. Um, I just want to thank John. Um, he's absolutely correct that the, the past three years have just been so much more active than the previous dozen years of our disaster prep committee since he came on board and has been working as chair. Um, and since we had wildfires so throughout our region, it has really inspired people to get involved. So we are very lucky to have John as our leader of this committee. He's been terrific in bringing people uh, together and getting a lot of a lot done. Um, we are also very lucky to have uh, Quinn. Quinn Gardner, uh, who is a great asset to this, to the city of San Rafael. And um, so I, don't, I, I, I just wanted to thank both of them for all of their efforts and collaboration and uh, what a wonderful uh, asset they've been to our community. And with that, I think we'll turn it over to Quinn. I, I get to have lunch with Quinn and her team regularly and other members of our committee do. And she's been just terrific. And providing the support and, and leading the tra various training sessions that we have with her team and all the community inspections that are being done. And, and uh, let, I'll let her <laughs> introduce herself a little bit more information. And also uh, uh, Kate Anderson, uh, who's joined her team, uh, who's looking after the areas that are kind of need management and clearance and fire prevention efforts. So Quinn, why don't you take over and tell us a little bit about yourself and and what your office does. Yeah, um, thanks, John. Thanks, Bonnie. I appreciate the kind words. And it makes my job a lot easier when, when things like the Disaster Coalition with, with San Pedro are formed. And um, you mentioned Glenwood is a great example of a neighborhood response group. So I thought I saw Steve's name somewhere. So um, the more right grassroots organization we have, the easier my role is. And it's, it's a great partnership. And, and we really appreciate it. Um, again, my name is Quinn Gardner. I'm now the Deputy Director um, of Emergency Management for the city. Um, so I oversee all of our disaster work, um, and obviously a lot of that time goes into wildfire, but I do do all hazard planning um, as well. Um, joined today with, by Kate Anderson, um, who's been with us about a year and a half. Um, we're super lucky to have her expertise on the team. Um, she's got a wildland firefighting background, um, forester, so she manages all of our open space kind of undeveloped projects, um, and it's a big part of this. And um, I'm going to start with the how with with close to home, and then she'll talk a little bit about open space, um, and we'll we'll give you some resources and and take Q's, Q and A while we can. So um, this image, I'm, oh, let me get my share screen going. Helps if you can see what I'm looking at, right? Um, there we go. So the the image here is from the Lucas Valley fire last year. Um, just one more example of how real fire is in Marin. Um, we tend to get lucky. This did have a big evacuation. Um, effort associated with it, um, but certainly is uh, it is very real for us, and I appreciate all the work that's been happening to help to help ultimately San Rafael adapt to wildfire. 
And you might have seen this new campaign um, through the Marine Wildfire Prevention Authority, which was the group created by the Measure C tax measure um, that voters overwhelmingly approved a couple years ago. It's putting about $20 million a year countywide into wildfire prevention, which is um, incredible. Um, so thank you to all of our voters and community for their support. Um, we've got counties across the state, even outside of the state, calling us and saying, how are you doing what you're doing? Um, and this tax measure and this authority is a huge piece of it. Um, so you'll see more and more of this campaign. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about what is adapting to wildfire. Um, we used to think a lot about this as wildfire prevention. Um, and certainly, as Kate could speak at length to, is, it, is not all fire is bad. Um, and we know fire is part of our ecology historically, as well as just our world and our reality. It's how do we make sure that we're adapted to it so that it, they stay minor, um, we can control them quickly, and we're not losing lives and property. Um, and when feasible, right, we let fire um, re-engage in the landscape in the right way. Um, so there's a couple great graphics I want to show, and I know this is a, a ton of, so I'll run through this, but essentially what is a fire adapted community? Um, and it really is a 360 approach. So it's not as simple as saying like, you must cut out this plant from your property, right? That might be what you hear from us, but we're doing all of these other things as well. And so it incorporates things like the policies and the plans that we have. So we have our community wildfire prevention plan. We have a 38 point um, wildfire action plan specific to San Rafael. Um, everything regarding evacuation. Um, the under sheriff mentioned alert Marin. So I appreciate that plug. Please make sure you're opted in to emergency alerts. Um, some people just assume they're automatically signed up. You have to register for emergency alerts um, to be notified. So please make, take that time to do that. Um, we look at prevention work, um, the mitigation work residents can do by becoming like a firewise community, your defensible space, home hardening, et cetera. So there's a ton of components here. Um, I'm really lucky at this point to have a team of, um, I think 15, 16 people now, we just added a few more seasonals um, that are all working on different parts of what it means to be fire adapted um, in San Rafael and in Marin County. Um, so some of the ways that specifically looks um, right is, is what kind of vegetation management we're doing on our properties, especially closest to homes and closest to roadways. Um, so that upper left image is actually part of our direct assistance program, um, which we are available and we are available to you whether you're in the city proper or you're in the county. Um, the, the funding that we're using for that applies to the entire geographic San Rafael zone. The MWPA can get a little bit complicated on how funding gets allocated, but just know our direct assistance program um, is available to you whether you're in the city or the county. Um, and depending on the type of work, we'll just come out and do it. You just got to sign a couple papers and no cost to you. And then hopefully you can save that money and use that for re-landscaping, home hardening, um, whatever you choose. Um, we're also doing a lot of work around evacuation improvements. Um, this is more, well, it's, it's half and half specific to the city and half to the county. So we'll do, we can do roadside vegetation removal, regardless of the jurisdiction. Um, when we actually start changing the roads, like we're doing with some of our other evacuation improvements, that is specific um, to city property. Um, and so really making sure that we maintain good, safe egress and access, um, either through um, clarifying parking regulations or removing vegetation along the roadways. Um, that bottom left was the broom pool a few years ago. Um, always a great event that the coalition puts on. Um, but we are doing those year round. We've got volunteers across the city. I think every other week we're working with them. Um, we are more than happy to help with debris removal. So if you are inspired by the Earth Day broom pool, um, please get one for your neighborhood. It doesn't have to be on that scale. It, it can just be five or six people. Um, we've got tools we can lend you, tarps, broom poolers, you name it. Um, you pile the debris and we'll come get rid of it for you. Um, again, at no cost. So um, we really love those community efforts and we're here to support them. And then of course, the bottom right, right, our defensible space, our home hardening programs, those one-on-one -on -one evaluations and education. Um, the city does manage the program specific to the city, um, but a very parallel program is run by the county. Um, and they're out and about doing very similar things, slightly different code, slightly different timing, um, but the intent is all the same as how are we educating and motivating residents um, to adapt their landscape to living with fire. And why that becomes so important and why what is constant and you know commonly thought of as this house out approach is so important is we know that the majority of homes lost to wildfire um, are being lost by where ember from embers landing and where embers land and what they ignite. And that's how we're losing these urban environments. 
Um, so this is our mailer this year, which went to San Rafael residents. So if you haven't seen this show up in your mailbox um, and you're a San Rafael resident, um, please take a look. Um, the front looks like that. Um, and it's got a bunch of resources for you. Um, so we really want you to be thinking about, especially that zero to five and that zero to 30 area around your home. Um, and the biggest thing is it's not about being void of vegetation. It's about adequate spacing vertically and horizontally and making sure you have good fire adapted plants. It's even better when they're drought tolerant, pollinator friendly, um, natives, all those good things. And we've got a lot of resources to help you pick um, the right plants for that. Um, so I mentioned our evaluation program. This is, if you're a San Rafael resident, this is the door hanger you'll see as we come around to your property. If you're a county resident, it'll be red, um, but very similar, right? So um, bottom line is there's a website on both um, and that's in that middle slide and you get an access code. And rather than waiting for us to send you your report, um, within 24 hours, your report's available and you can just log into the website and look at those recommendations or requirements of things that you need to do to adapt your property um, to, to wildfire. And for San Rafael residents, you're also gonna get a little additional information on emergency alerts um, and a new system called Zone Haven that I'll talk about at the end of the presentation as well. Um, but we are with you in partnership to help you adapt your landscape on your property um, while we work on open space. And this is my, my slide before I transition to Kate. And why I think this is so important is to understand that we lose homes to wildfire. But what's really fascinating, especially this larger image on the left, if you notice down towards the bottom, the burn is coming from the house out, right? There's still some grass left from the road in. This fire didn't come as one sweeping wave to the homes. Again, what happened was a bunch of embers landed in highly combustible material, whether that was ground covering, leaf litter in the gutters or something like that. It ignited that home and that home actually is what caused the vegetation around it to burn and those trees. Um, so in these images on the right, again, you can see this with enough space, right, between homes and, and vegetation, homes can survive in the middle of intense fire. That 30 foot buffer is absolutely essential and what you do, especially within that 30 foot zone, and then going from 30 to 100, it can, it can get a little bit um, lighter in terms of your treatment, um, but that's how we make our homes survive, is that zero to five and that zero to 30, um, which for, for most of our residents, you do have control over. Um, and so you can make a huge difference there. That's not to say we're not paying attention to the open space and our undeveloped lands. Um, we're doing a lot of work around that and Kate's gonna touch on some of that really quickly. Hey, thanks for that, Quinn. Um, perfect segue into our next slide here. Um, as we touch on open space and kind of the management that we're doing in those areas, especially because the whole Point San Pedro area is directly against the open space, um, including China Camp, uh, City of San Rafael, um, and some other undeveloped lots. Um, it's really important to focus on exactly where we're doing that work. Um, I just want to show a few examples of some of the work that we have planned in progress and have completed um, this last year. And just the focus around the homes is our initial first step. Um, it's incredibly important, especially with that direct interface to the open space um, that we're working from your homes. Um, utilizing all the resources that we can provide, including those evaluations and any other sort of grants or direct assistance um, as we move out from there. Um, that's only going to help your home survive. And the whole intent of this is to influence fire behavior in a way to um, protect you in the event of evacuation, but also to protect our responding uh, emergency responders, our firefighters, our law enforcement, as they come to these areas to um, help suppress or manage that fire. Uh, next slide, Quinn. Um, so this is a map that uh, will look familiar to all of you. Um, and just wanted to illustrate how much of the Point San Pedro Road area is in that wildland urban interface. And we can see kind of that tan area um, that really extends out from um, those individual parcels that you can see out into the open space um, in that wildland urban interface zone. And that's either an urban interface, and this is what we see in Glenwood a lot, you know, we're directly against the open space, 
But looking at the country club, it's more of an inner mix. You know, we have larger lots, some of them are undeveloped, some are lightly developed, um, but there's a lot of um, kind of open space like land kind of in between all that. So our approach in Glenwood and other areas with um, smaller lots, but more of the subdivision against the open space, um, it's gonna be a little bit different than country club where we wanna focus on um, defensible space around those homes to the edge of the property lines. Um, so a little bit more on the individual landowner um, because there's just a little bit more uh, wildland, um, wildland areas kind of in between the homes there. Um, yeah, so going on, um, just wanna cover how we prioritize the treatments that we're doing, how we plan our projects and who we partner with and some other considerations considering environmental um, and then debris management as well. So how do we prioritize our treatment areas? Um, as we've covered pretty heavily, it's a house out approach. Um, you know, our, our initial, kind of our top priority in the event of a fire or any other emergency is uh, protection of lives, um, both you and our responding, um, responding equipment or emergency responders. Um, so the house out is the first thing. That's, that's really the, the most critical part to protect yourself and your home survival and provide a safe space for responders to come and uh, do what they need to do. Um, the second part of that is focusing on our emergency access routes and ev evacuation routes. Quinn touched on that with the projects that we're doing there. Um, and then if we need to, we do need to get into the open space to help suppress these fires at some point. So we're also working on fire road um, clearances. And that's what we can see in these photos here. Um, this is up on San Pedro Mountain, um, up in, uh, I believe this is still the city's portion. Um, but what we see along the roads, um, is a tremendous amount of broom. That's gonna be a long, a uh, long cycle of maintenance to keep that under control, um, but with frequent and consistent maintenance over time, um, we can see a difference. And this is a good, a good after picture of just um, the right after and through um, consistent maintenance over time. Hopefully, we can keep those um, those access routes safe. Um, and then after all of that. We are going to look outside of that interface um, directly against the, the built environment um, into some more strategic fuel breaks that might be along uh, ridge lines or other, other strategic areas um, within the topography. And yeah, moving on to how do we plan these projects now that we've prioritized where we want to do them. Um, first, we're going to develop the specific treatment prescriptions. Um, that's going to be based on the vegetation community in that area. Um, that could be past management, whether this is an initial entry into an area or um, if this is more of a maintenance. Um, it's going to depend on different topographic features, uh, the, the slope. Some, some areas we really just can't treat because there's erosion issues that would come from removing that vegetation. Um, and aspect, which direction that slope faces is also uh, pretty critical, whether it's southern facing and it's hotter and drier or more northern facing where there's more fuel moisture and maybe that's not as high of a priority. Um, there's also past ignition history. Um, if we know that there's a high likelihood of ignition in an area, we're going to look at that a little bit more closely as well. Um, and then moving on to environmental compliance, uh, this is a really critical piece of our planning. Um, especially with the open space um, near the San Pedro area. And we have uh, China Camp State Park, we have City of San Rafael, and we have private land ownerships as well. Um, they all have different management objectives, um, whether that's ecological objectives, conservation objectives, or fire mitigation. Um, and so we really want to do uh, a really large uh, analysis of all those management objectives as we consider our best management practices. Um, the first step in doing that is to comply with CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, and in doing that, um, we're going to evaluate for nesting birds if we're working in that season. Um, and we're also going to do an extensive uh, overview of sensitive plants and animals in the area that could exist. Um, and then debris management is a really big part of our planning. Um, 
And a lot of times, as we can see in the pictures here, we're going to use different methods for the actual treatment and the debris disposal. You know, once we take the material down, what do we want to do with that? A lot of times it's best to take the material out. We're reducing the actual fuel load in that area. Um, but depending on access or uh, slope, we might not be able to do that. And that's where tools like uh, in that top left, um, we have a masticator um, or a mulcher um, that's really effective for essentially mulching material in place and it really beds down and decomposes quickly. Um, it's a really effective tool to move through, especially the fire roads uh, quickly and cost effectively and also keeps less people um, fewer people out of the area. And so hopefully less injuries occur. Um, we have in the bottom left, uh, kind of a typical hand crew um, doing fuel reduction. Um, and so that leads right into who we're partnering with for these projects. Um, in our planning, um, just as I mentioned, and um, I think Point San Pedro Road Coalition is a perfect example of kind of a patchwork of jurisdictions. Um, the open space around you is also a mosaic and a patchwork of different um, land ownerships and jurisdictions as well. Um, so in our planning, we work really closely with state parks, um, hoping that we're meeting kind of meeting in the middle on all of our shared objectives um, and also Marin County Fire. They're a really, really critical partner um, in planning um, because they are also a first responder to any fires that we're going to have in or the county county jurisdiction. So their, their input on our planning is really important as well. Um, and then for implementation, we do hire contractors, but we also want to continue to foster relationships with Marin County Fire and utilizing their, um, their hand crews. As so we can see in that top left photo, um, we're also working with a, a new program, the Fire Foundry, which is a collaboration of the Marin County Fire Department and um, Conservation Corps North Bay. Um, and that's an entry level program for people wanting to get into the fire service. Um, and then more recently, and in the past as well, we've partnered with CAL FIRE. Um, and their conservation crews to come help us do work. And you know, all this is really good to um, also familiarize those crews with the areas that, um, you know, who we don't know what, what this year will bring or next year, but it's also a preview for them um, to really get to know the area and the work that they've done there in the event of a fire, if they do come back. Awesome, thanks Kate. I know we've got just a couple of minutes. So really quickly, I wanna, um, run through um, some resources that are available to you. And these are, again, not specific to a jurisdiction. So um, tripper days are back. Um, so that service that was available last year is, I think last week was the first week. Um, so please go to tripperday.com slash Marin, that website's on the bottom left, um, and type in your address and it'll tell you the weeks that the tripper is gonna be in your neighborhood. Remember it is a full week, even though it will only sometimes say the first Monday, but it's that whole week they'll be there. Um, make sure you include your zip code. Um, if you get an error that says we're not in your area, go back and make sure you actually put in your full address. We've had some folks had issues with that. Um, we do have our direct assistance program available. Um, I think the Fire Foundry, Kate mentioned we were working with them last week. I think they helped 15 plus property owners last week alone. Um, so about a week a month, we have them dedicated to, to helping folks do that work. Um, so get in quick, because I think we're already halfway through scheduling next month's, um, next month's crew if you need some help. Um, there are grants available. Um, so there's grants available specific to city of San Rafael residents and there's grants available countywide. You might qualify for more than one grant. Um, and I'm gonna show you where all this is on our website here on my next slide. Um, and then of course, the more Firewise communities we get, the better. And there are grants available to Firewise communities. So especially if you're an HOA um, and you're concerned about the finances to maintain your public land that you own, um, Firewise is a great way to do that. You can become fire, right? Your fire adapted as a community, uh, but then you might also be able to get funding to work on some of your community land, um, which can be really helpful. So that's a map of, of what we've got kind of in Marin there and constantly growing. Um, so appreciate our Firewise leaders and our communities. Um, and then I mentioned real quick, so on SRFD's website, um, this is our landing page right on the front page. So you just go to srfd.org. Um, scroll down just a little bit past a couple other things and you'll see the plan and prepare for wildfire and you'll see all these different image icons.
This is going to get you directly to all these resources we just talked about. So our direct assistance program is here. The financial assistance is the grant program. Um, information on the chipper days is right there for you. Um, as well as if you want more details on the different projects Kate and her team are working on with these open space, those are there. Um, evacuation information, um, which I'll show you here in the next slide, um, as well as information on how to register for alerts. So it's all right here for you. Um, please take a look. We've got FAQs and all sorts of other things as well. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Um, here's a list of resources and I'll, I'll send this PowerPoint to John and Bonnie as well if they wanna share it out directly. Um, for the, what actually, um, this top right image I wanna touch on real quick because this is Zone Haven, which is my bottom bullet point here. Um, but these are the evacuation zones that are developed. This is a public interface. You can get there through community.zonehaven.org. It does inner work with Alert Marin. So if we need to evacuate a zone, we can actually click that zone and we know the exact addresses they're gonna get messages and things like that. Um, and we also designed it to adapt to flooding as well. So, you know, essentially out in your area, um, south of the, the road versus north of the road, right? Is kind of your flood versus fire areas. Um, and so those zones kind of break down there. Um, if you're interested on the overall uh, projects the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority is working on, if you go to their website, there's a tab right there that says projects and you can see everything that's happening and you can actually see the work plan for the next year as well with maps and all sorts of good information. So all of that information is publicly available. Uh, and then I do wanna point out this emergency portal, whoops, sorry. Um, is fairly new, um, the second to last bullet point, but please save this on your phone, on your computer. It's just emergency.marincounty.org. Um, when there are emergencies, this is gonna be your place to get as up-to-date information as possible. There's a map that'll show road closures, shelter locations, things like that. Um, so that's a great resource. Um, ReadyMarin and SROES.org are gonna be a lot more preparedness information. Um, whereas the portal is going to be your, your current um, emergency information. Um, so I, I know we're probably getting really close to time. I saw a couple questions in the chat. Um, I will try to briefly address them. And I would say if you don't feel like you got the answer from me, um, Kate can put her email in the chat and you can reach out directly to her. Um, yeah, broom is challenging. Um, the, the big answer is it's, we, have to, we have to get rid of the seed bank. Um, and so if we can get the mature plants out of there and then um, come back year after year for a couple of years to get the baby plants, then eventually we've eradicated the seed bank. Um, and we can do that through broom, multiple broom pool events, um, grazing. Once we get the, the baby plants, the goats are pretty good at, at getting rid of, um, but it does take a multi-year effort um, to really remove that seed bank. Um, Large open space, yeah, so depending on what that is, if it's um, privately owned, we are working with them, but again, it's that house out approach. So um, we're not necessarily concerned with all 10 acres of a particular parcel. We're most concerned with those areas that are gonna border roads, fire roads and homes. Um, and so we'll work with the, the folks on that. Um, again, grants are available to them. Some larger property owners we're working with to do projects like Kate mentioned in terms of partnership opportunities. Um, so it, it is a process uh, and it also depends whether they're city or county and then our enforcement jurisdiction changes a little bit. Um, so there's, there's some nuances there as well. Um, the eucalyptus, um, so generally speaking, mature trees are not our primary concern right now. Um, we're really concerned about ladder fuels and ground fuels and surface fuels, um, things that take fire from the ground where we can relatively easily control it into the canopy where it becomes much more intense, spreads embers much further, et cetera. So with eucalyptus and, and most mature trees, our biggest focus right now is the understory of those. Um, and there are some that we're looking at removing, uh, but the other challenge with eucalyptus is if we can't treat them with herbicide, they're gonna grow right back and they're gonna grow more dangerous than they probably are right now. Um, so Kate mentioned, we're going through the environmental process on a lot of different projects. Um, and we're just starting um, topical specified treatment with herbicides on a eucalyptus grove. Um, so we're a few years out from being able to do large eucalyptus grove um, treatments, but it is, it is a planning project um, in process um, is the best answer I can probably put out right now on that. Um, were there other questions or do we have more time? Yeah, there were yeah, a few other questions. Minute. 
Um, a few other questions. One was um, really from me. Um, there had been uh, evaluations of individual properties with regard to defensible space, and those reports were produced. And it's been a, a bit of time since then, and many of those were done when the owner wasn't present. Can those be repeated uh, on by an owner request who'd like to have them come out and do a, a defensible uh, space an analysis on their property? Yeah, so slightly different answer for city and county here. Um, in both cases, we are seeing, um, we're back into doing broad swaths. So over the winter, we did much more by request. Um, I think we actually just had folks out in Glenwood. Um, so we've got our inspectors going door to door. Um, but if you if you wanna call and request an inspe inspection, especially if you're interested in applying for the grant. So even if you're not, that could be your trick to get my team to come out and take a look at your property. Um, then we'll come out and we'll do one-offs, um, but we're, it obviously takes a lot longer to drive out and do individual inspections than to be able to be in a neighborhood and do the whole area at once. Um, and so we are doing those um, and we're happy to do that. And one of the reasons we actually updated the mailers as a city is we wanted to provide you with the list. Um, so to some extent, some of this, I'm hoping we've given you enough information that you can start kind of evaluating your own property, um, but we're more than happy to come out. Um, the county is also in a broad swath, so they're kind of going neighborhood by neighborhood. We're all trying to do it before chipper schedules, so depending on when the chipper is in your neighborhood, we're trying to get to you two to four weeks before that, so you have the information going into the chipper week. Um, but again, we can come out and we can do those individual one-offs. I can't fully speak for the county on that, um, so Bayside and Country Club might be a little bit different there in some other unincorporated areas. Um, I don't have much of an update for the fire station um, 55. I, I last I roughly heard end of year, early spring, hopefully it's going to be done, um, but I, I don't have much more information there. I know it's um, it's a big earthquake retrofit and we're, we're super grateful and excited. It's the last of um, two stations getting updated um, and then we'll be done with our, we'll have poor Tara Linda didn't get touched, but um, it was the newer station, but everything else will be um, pretty solid and we appreciate again everybody's support of those projects over the last 10 years or so and my last pitch um, John already mentioned the meeting we're going to schedule for July so he'll have that information going out um, next week on the 9th um, fire safe Marin is hosting um, regional workshops and San Rafael's zone is on the 9th um, so if you want to hear more about what we've completed in terms of projects and what's on the horizon of, of projects to come um, it's just a half hour workshop we'll cover kind of our hoorah, what we completed and, and what's next. I believe it's 5.30, it could be six, um, but it's on the Fire Safe Marine website. Um, so that'll be another quick one. And those will be recorded and available after the fact as well. Any other questions or comments or feedback? I think we might've run out of time, so. Uh... Yeah, we're three minutes behind. All right. Guilty. <laughs> Very important for music your time and attention and all the efforts happening and um, think about becoming firewise um, and think about what you can do, be doing on your own property and we're here to support you in a variety of ways so just reach out. Well, thanks I'll for being here on a week. Generic reach out email in the chat as well for everybody. Thanks for being here on the weekends really help. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Quinn. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. It's nice. Nice to meet and speak to you. So I think the next item on the agenda is uh, for Kathleen. I don't know who's doing that yes, introduction. Yes, yes. Um, no, I'm doing the introduction. Okay. And uh, first of all, thank you, Quinn and Kate. That was so informative. And it's my pleasure to introduce Kathleen Schaefer. And we came to know, some of us of the coalition have come to know Kathleen uh, through a collaboration that has been forming amongst uh, a variety of community groups in different parts of San Rafael to develop a sea level rise initiative to take proactive measures. So uh, this will help mitigate the foreseeable flooding and other negative impacts of this. And Kathleen has been there to inform us along the way uh, she is a nationally recognized expert in flood risk and uh, we're flood risk management. And we feel so fortunate that she agreed to come and speak about this area to the community today. 
She has over 20 years of water resources management experience in both public and private sectors. She has a master's degree in chemical engineering from the University of Virginia and is currently pursuing her PhD in civil engineering at the UC Davis Watershed Science Center. She is a passionate advocate for replacing our nation's antiquated flood control philosophy with a modern science-based data-driven integrated flood risk management philosophy that builds resilient communities and that's what she foresees for our greater community the point san pedro road area and extending further out and without further ado i'm going to turn the platform over to kathleen thank you so much um and uh let me see if i can see you i have a tendency. There we go. Um, yes, first, I want to thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, my research shows that organizations such as yours um, are really key to uh, effective flood management and they're a best practice. So, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak and just thank you for all the great work that you all are doing. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is, you know, why are we talking about floods? We're in the middle of a drought. Well, the research is showing that um, with climate change, California can expect uh, to experience climate whiplash. We can expect to go from periods of drought to extreme uh, weather events, uh, to extreme flooding events very rapidly. So if we ask, when is the drought going to end? Uh, the research suggests that it's going to end when we have a Godzilla El Nino. It's going to end when we have an atmospheric river that slams into our coast. And the research we're, um, is showing that we're really getting an understanding of the role of atmospheric rivers in our, in our weather patterns. Atmospheric rivers are long, sinuous corridors of water vapor that go come from the Pacific and slam into our coast. They're called atmospheric rivers because they contain uh, as much moisture in some events as the Mississippi River. They're the major supplier of our water supply system and play a major role in our uh, California weather. And the research shows that these uh, uh, atmospheric rivers are maybe not likely to be more frequent, but they are likely to be more intense. So what, and uh, at the same time, we know, we've talked briefly a bit about uh, the fact that climate change is also going to lead to sea level rise and a shout out to all the work that's been done by the Bay Conservation Development Commission in uh, their adapting to rising tides and letting uh, people know about the potential for uh, sea level rise. Um, I also want to point out that communities can no longer hide their flood risk uh, behind uh, antiquated FEMA maps. There are organizations like First Street that are producing easy to read and easy to understand maps like Flood Factor that are providing details about flood risk information and making it readily available to, uh, to anyone who wants to, uh, to, to view it. When I started my dissertation five years ago, the research suggested that homeowners were not taking uh, sea level rise and climate change into effect when they were uh, uh, making buying decisions for their homes. A paper recently published by a colleague of mine suggests that that is no longer true, that there is an increasing awareness of the potential for sea level rise to impact housing prices. So, um, if you live uh, in, up in the hills and think that sea level rise is not going to impact you, um, it, it may in fact uh, manifest itself through higher bond prices for municipal bonds and uh, for reduced uh, uh, housing prices. I'm not sure it will affect how it will affect Marin, but it certainly is something um, that uh, ent entities, boot, uh, bond companies like Moody's are taking into account. The Plan Bay Area 2050 has identified that uh, 
the Bay Area has a $16 billion funding gap uh, to adapt to two, level, two feet of sea level rise by 2050. So uh, I sit on a technical working group for BCDC on looking at how we can finance this. And I will tell you that there's an array of, uh, of uh, options being explored. Uh, but we are going to have to face the reality that um, sea level rise is going, we're going to have to make major investments uh, to combat the impacts of sea level rise. One of the most surprising things I found in my research is the, is the degree to which our existing governance structure uh, really doesn't take into account the different kinds of flooding that we have. If uh, atmospheric rivers in combination with sea level rise manifest themselves in different kinds of flooding. There's flooding from man-made infrastructure that may fail. There's a flooding that may occur from sewers that overflow. There's flooding that may occur from groundwater as the sea level rise, our groundwater tables are likely to rise and that's going to uh, cause problems. There's flooding that's called fluvial flooding, and that's the flooding that comes from the main stem of a river so, or a creek. So the flooding that comes when San, uh, the San Rafael Creek overflows, that would be considered fluvial flooding. There's another kind of flooding that is shallow overland flooding that's called pluvial flooding. And that comes when you just have a deluge that just overwhelms the local storm drain system. And then there's tidal flooding, and we see the sea level rise will impact that. We have uh, uh, king tides and storm surge, and the flooding that happened uh, in San Rafael a number of years ago, that was tidal flooding that came from a big surge event. And the way that we have traditionally dealt with this is that we have different organizations dealing with the different kinds of flooding. Um, so you have, we have in Marin, we have the Marin Flood Control Agency that deals primarily with fluvial flooding, and they rarely deal with the impacts of pluvial flooding. And you have for the city of San Rafael, they deal with the pluvial flooding, but they really don't have the resources to deal with tidal flooding and fluvial flooding. And there's really nobody dealing with the potential for groundwater flooding. Um, and an example of kind of one of the impacts of not having an organized governance that really looks at the full suite of flooding impacts um, is if we look at, uh, compare San Rafael to Stockton. Um, San Rafael, in, uh, 10 years ago, uh, as a FEMA employee, I issued new maps to both uh, the Marin uh, County shoreline and Marin County, uh, and I issued new FEMA maps to San Joaquin County and Stockton. And uh, in Marin, in San Rafael, we have this, the canal area, and you see this picture that I think many of you have seen that's produced by, uh, by Stuart Siegel. And it shows that uh, the potential for flooding uh, for uh, San Rafael can come from the canal district. And the, uh, San Rafael has been sort of wrestling with what to do about that. Um, in contrast, um, we have the city of Stockton. They have a very similar situation. They have an area called the Smith Canal. It's a canal very similar in shape to, to our canal district. It was constructed a number of years ago uh, or at the turn of the century to provide services to the state hospital school at the end of the canal. But the, the difference between the two communities is that when faced with the FEMA maps, they sent, uh, Stockton organized themselves and assessed themselves a fee. And they've been mo moving forward with what's called a closure structure, a structure that will remain open and allow ships to go in and out most of the time. And then on those very rare occasions when there's a storm surge likely to impact, it will close. Uh, much like the, in many respects, like the Venice Canal. Um, the point I want to make is that this structure is going to cost $37 million. And the city or the, the uh, of Stockton Flight Control Agency has received $22 million in state funding and a number of uh, other funding sources 
uh, to make it happen. So my point to this is that by organizing and taking action, a collective action, there is an opportunity for state funding and uh, federal funding to help, um, help mitigate and move forward some of the actions that you may wish to take. The other surprising thing that I found in my research is the degree to which we really don't consider a recovery in our cycle. So we currently have um, uh, efforts for mitigation. You have ordinances that require that you elevate your home. And there is the building department in San Rafael and in Marin County that takes some measures of mitigation. There are some efforts in preparation uh, and you see some of that. And, and uh, there are some ongoing activities with response. Uh, talk, Quinn talked about uh, the uh, um, evacuation route planning. Uh, and I know I spoke briefly with her before the meeting and they're planning to do more. Uh, but the real gap is in the recovery. And we can see what will happen if we don't plan effectively for recovery by looking at what happened uh, a number of years ago when the Coyote Creek in San, uh, Santa Clara overflowed. Um, the, the recovery plan for the uh, flood event of Coyote Creek uh, for, uh, in Santa Clara County was a GoFundMe site. When they had hundreds of people lose their cars and uh, be displaced, they set up a GoFundMe site and then they scrambled around to see if there were some used vehicles that the county and the city public works department could give to folks. And then they waited for 10 years uh, to have the uh, legal uh, the legal process go through its path and they paid $25 million. And uh, my point is that so much of that could have been prevented if we, if we um, would have collect, if they would have taken a more proactive approach in recovery. And they're not alone. That's just generally the way our system is. Um, and it's one of the major flaws in our, in our program. The solution to that is what they're doing in Europe. In Europe, uh, they are taking what's called the source pathway receptor consequence approach. They're looking at all of the different sources of flooding uh, and looking at how can, what's the pathway to get to a receptor or person or, or of something of interest in the floodplain. And they take a very holistic approach um, to, to that. So they try to reduce either the source, sometimes they uh, reduce the uh, opportunities for the pathway, uh, uh, they also uh, work to reduce uh, the consequences of the receptor. And you can do that through a variety of ways. You can elevate homes, you can make sure that you have a safe uh, access out of the flood zone, uh, you can have green roofs, you can have detention ponds, there's a variety of things that you can take. And my research is showing that the insurance is a really underappreciated tool in helping to buy down risk. Um, that um, there's a lot of interest now you know, in the insurance community to work with communities like yourselves to, to take advantage of the flood reduction potential for things like wetlands and to work in collaboration to, to either fund the wetlands or to uh, at least take advantage of the opportunity for flood mitigation that wetlands provide to us. So it's a collaborative effort um, uh, with the insurance providers uh, and the insurance community working together with the community. And that's something we haven't really done before, but it's something that is really of interest uh, by the insurance commissioner's office and the Department of Water Resources. And so I'm working with them and we're one of my pitches for today is that I'm looking for pilot communities or communities that are interested in, in working with uh, me and the Department of Insurance and the Department of Water to, to examine these opportunities. And I wanted to just, uh, one of the benefits is, is uh, community-based flood protection. And uh, it was interesting to see, I was gonna try to scramble uh, to see Quinn's uh, chart that was very similar um, and try to cut it and paste it in real quickly because the same things that she advocated in her uh, 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 chart are the same things that can be applied to improve um, your community-based 
your flood protection measures. And um, so I just wanna kind of put a shout out for um, kind of thinking about our flood risk in a different way. And with that, I will stop sharing and uh, answer any questions anyone may have. Before anybody asks a question, I just want to thank you for a very informative presentation. Oh. That was great. I just want to start with a, a, a big expression of gratitude um, that you are always uh, so clearly able to describe the issues. Um, and uh, I, I hope that uh, others feel the same. I see hands raised, so I don't want to take any more time. Uh, so Winifred, you go, want to go first? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Kathleen. That was so uh, informative and interesting. And you did mention wetlands. So do the insur do insur does the um, insurance department envision wetlands as playing an important role in flood flooding mitigation? Yes, they do. They they're really looking, wanting to see a way that that the mitigation that wetlands uh, have the potential, um, examining how can we quantify that in a way that then can be translated into uh, cheaper um, uh, flood insurance premiums, or how can a flood insurance um, companies perhaps fund mitigation, uh, wetlands mitigation measures. Mm. Do they have an idea of what that looks like? I mean, do they have like wetlands experts that would know exactly how that would play out in different scenarios or they just have a general idea that wetlands could play an important role? They have a general idea. They're working with, um, they're currently working, uh, we are currently working with the Nature Conservancy and with Scripps Institute. Scripps has done a pilot study of what uh, the opportunities are for a location just south of the San Francisco airport. And it's a part of an ongoing uh, effort. And so it would be great to get in on the ground floor. We could take advantage of, of some of those, um, that interest. Thank you. Uh, Maggie Phillips, if you'd uh, unmute yourself, you have a question to ask. Yeah, I'm curious to know, um, you said something about uh, volunteer communities to work on a pilot program. I live at the Strand, which is literally on top of the Loch Lomond Marina. And um, that piqued my interest because we're right on the water. Yeah, we're looking for, um, uh, for, for pilots. Um, uh, last year, actually two years ago now, the insurance commissioner's office uh, did a first of its kind study on the role that insurance can play in helping to mitigate climate risk. They looked at three things. They looked at fire risk, they looked at flood risk, and they looked at heat and how can uh, uh, nature-based solutions and working together with climate, um, with, um, climate adaptation measures, how can it reduce the risk? And the recommendation from that uh, uh, working group was that the uh, insurance commissioner's office stand up four pilot locations, one for each of the, or four for each of the three different kinds of risk. I'm currently working with the insurance commissioner's office to look at and look for pilots um, for flood. Uh, our first pilot is the city of San, of the small community of Isleton. They've already started and they're moving forward and we're looking for other pilots. And so I would love to have San Rafael be a pilot. So, so you mean San, San Rafael in or the, not, a, not an HOA? Yeah, or, or the shoreline, yeah. Uh, I, I just would like to interject. Uh, so Maggie, uh, Winifred, who's also a resident of your, of your neighborhood, uh, Winifred and I, along with Katie Miller from our coalition board, have been meeting with uh, other representatives of different communities like the Spinnaker neighborhood, Spinnaker Point, Bay Point, and also with the Canal uh, community folks. Um, we are trying to determine the scope of our collaboration and what, what makes sense, but we're talking about this, not North San Rafael, but 
a certain uh, area where we have common interest to form a group. And we've been meeting with people like Kathleen and Stuart Siegel and other folks who are very knowledgeable to inform us so that we can start this collaboration between the neighborhood groups that might come together uh, in what Kathleen is describing. So uh, we, we're organizing, we're working on that, and we're kind of, uh, we've been doing this for a few months now, gathering information about what, what's the best approach to take. There was a oh, question. Oh, one more thing. Oh, I just wanted to mention one other thing. When you mentioned Stuart Siegel, um, for those who are interested in who may have um, missed the um, presentation that we, the coalition put on about flooding and sea level rise in our community, the Point San Pedro Road uh, corridor, uh, we do have a recording posted on our YouTube channel uh, that talks about that. Stuart Siegel uh, was a participant at, at presenter in that and Jeff Rhodes from Resilient Shore also. So for those people who want further information um, and, um, and then this is uh, also one of the questions from the chat was about where, uh, this is for Kathleen, where can we find good map, flood maps? Where can you find good flood maps? Um, you can go to floodfactor.org uh, or um, yeah, floodfactor.org. Uh, they produce a map and you can also, um, Marin County has um, a really great website uh, that posts the FEMA maps. So if you go Google uh, Marin County and flood maps, you can get to them from there as well. Well, it's 11 o'clock and I don't see any other hands raised. So I think we're on time for uh, completion. And um, I wanted to say thank you to all the attendees and all the presenters uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, thanks to all our uh, committee chairs and uh, board members and to everyone that makes this a successful coalition. And I wanna uh, sign off now and respect everyone's time, but thank you so much. Uh, for joining us this morning. Oh, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody, so much. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. yes. Bye.